Don't let what you are stop you from being what you could be. Right. And so then the question is, well, what do you identify with? Do you identify with what you are? Then you're a tyrant. Do you identify with, with chaos? Because that's the opposite of order, say. Then you're nihilistic. Well, you don't identify with either of those. You, you know that they're both necessary. You know that you have to live with both of them. But you, would, you identify with the capacity to continually transcend what you are. And then you seek out error. That's what humility is. It's like, I'm error-ridden. It's like, so I want to see. I want to put myself in a situation where I can discover one of my errors. Hopefully not in a way that's going to knock me completely out of the game, right? I, I, want, to, I want to seek out a challenge. I want to find out where my limits are. I want to find out where there's not enough of me yet. And I want to do that in a way that's engaging because, you know, you can wear yourself out fighting dragons, obviously. You can exhaust yourself completely and that's not helpful. You know, one, one of the things I learned, for example, when I was coaching when I was coaching lawyers, who these were people who had very high-end careers, and so they had an infinite workload, no matter how much they worked, flat out, there was always way more work that they should do. It's a very difficult thing to learn to manage. And so they were exhausting themselves, and, and I said, well, you know, you have to work less per day. It's like, well, no, that's not happening. I, I can't do that. And so well, the, what I learned over time was, okay, so this is what you have to do. Every three months, you have to block off four days and go have a vacation. And you have to plan that in advance so it's in your calendar so that your secretary doesn't book your time. And then you need that because you have to recuperate enough so that you can work as hard as you're going to work. And of course, they were nervous about that. And I said, well, look, we can, we can calibrate this. Let's keep track of your billable hours over the next year and see if they increase or decrease. Because I bet you if you take more time off, you'll actually have more billable hours. You'll actually have your cake and eat it too. You'll get to have a vacation and you'll be more productive. And that inevitably that was what happened. And so that's a matter of calibrating the game properly, right? You want to play a game that you can play today, but also one that you can play next week and next month. We're not talking about, you know, your your career this week. We're talking about you having a career that lasts 30 years, that doesn't kill you, that doesn't make you hate yourself or the job, that doesn't make you bitter, that doesn't wear you to a frazzle. So we, it has to be optimized. And so I think that you can, in fact, decide to take on the load that's optimally meaningful if you want, and then you get to have your cake and eat it too. You're on the pathway to continual incremental improvement. You only have to burn off a feather at a time instead of having the whole bloody thing burst into flames. But it's a constant, it's a constant source of renewal. And there's an idea that to be renewed, you have to drink the water of life, right? That, that, that's an old mythological idea. And what's the water? The water of life, chaos is water. water. Water is chaos. Water is what washes away too much order. And to stay continually, let's say, uh, um, refreshed by the water of life is to take on exactly the right amount of chaos to make sure that your garden is properly nourished. And I think meaning is actually the marker of that. And, and as I said, you know that I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself either naive or a particularly optimistic person. I don't think I'm either of those. But this is an, actually an idea, this is one of the only ideas that I've ever found that I really believe to be rock solid. I actually think that it's true. And, and it's very optimistic because it says, you can use your sense of meaning to calibrate your progress through life. It, but, but there's rules. You have to aim at the highest possible good that you can conceive. Now, and, and that's subject to update, because what the hell do you know? But you know, start by aiming at the star you can see, rather than the dimmer one that you can't yet perceive. And then you decide that you're going to do that honestly, right? There's, that, that's a big decision. So uh, the first decision, I think, in some sense, is a decision of love. You're going to decide that being is worthwhile and that you're going to work for its betterment. And that's a decision that's based on love. And the second decision is based on truth. Having made that decision, you're going to play a straight game. Having made those two decisions, I think that you can allow your sense of meaning to calibrate your pathway. And then what's so interesting is that you hit a state that's as close to paradisal as you're going to hit right away because being engaged like that, it's better to be engaged in the solution of a complex problem than not to have a problem at all. And that's, that's no different than saying it's better for there to be being than non-being because being is a problem. And so, if you want to have no problems, then you have no being. And, and you could say, well, being is so miserable that maybe that's the route we should take. And fair enough, but maybe you can have your cake and eat it too. You can have the damn problem 
it can be a problem worth solving, and you can be so engaged in solving the problem that it justifies the fact that the problem exists. And then you get then you get to have you get to have the problem and the solution at the same time. And maybe that's better than not having the problem at all. And I believe that because one of the things I have seen, and I've seen this so interesting, being so interesting when I've been lecturing to people, especially more recently, and, and this is also manifested on you, my, itself on YouTube. I'm talking to people a lot about responsibility, and it's young men in particular that seem to be responding to that. And I think that's partly because I think that young women, in some sense, have their responsibility map already laid out for them. It's, it's also less voluntary, in some sense, for women, because they have more complicated problems to solve in the first part of their life, right? They, because they have to get the family problem solved. But whatever. I've been talking very, in a very delineated manner about responsibility. Which is a strange thing to sell to people, but responsibility is what gives your life meaning. And so then you might say, well, then take on ultimate responsibility. And what happens? You have an ultimately meaningful life. And then you might say, well, if your life is ultimately meaningful, it doesn't matter if it's punctuated by tragedy or even predicated on tragedy. It's worth it. And I think that's true. And it, everything I've seen indicates to me that's true. Every time I get my clients to take on more responsibility, you know, it, and it isn't an injunction. You're a bad person, you should take on responsibility. It has nothing to do with that. You can define the damn responsibility. It isn't something that, that someone else should impose on you. It's not a matter of doing what you should do in some abstract manner. It's, it's not that. It's the choice of what game you're going to play. And you know, you can play the game of the seeker, I would say, and if you play that game, then everyone wins. And it's the best game you can play. And so, the, the, the answer in some sense to the tragedy of life, to the catastrophe of life, to the fall, is to adopt the responsibility of mortality that goes along with that, and to play that game maximally. And paradoxically, it's in the willingness to do that, that the solution emerges. And I don't, you know, I have done my best with every single thing I've talked to you guys about. I have done my best to do what Dostoevsky does in his novels, which is I make a proposition and then I spend months or years trying to figure out if I can take the bloody thing apart, if there's something wrong with it, because I want to find out. I want to hit it with a hammer and see if it breaks. And what I've been trying to do is to tell you all the things that I've gathered, let's say, or, or laid out, or articulated, or discovered over the last 30 years, that I have not been able to break with the biggest hammer that I could take to them. And I guess that's the fundamental one, is that I, I believe that the, the, um, the idea that lurks in these images, derived from very different cultures, it's the same idea. Life is suffering. Right. Indisputable. What do you do about that? You, you voluntarily accept it. And then strive to overcome the suffering that's a consequence of that. And you do that for you, and you do that in a way that makes it better for other people. And then that works. And one question might be, well, how well does it work? And the answer is, you'll, the only way that you can find out is by trying it. That's it. That's the existential element of it. The proof is to be derived by the incarnation of the attitude in your own life. No one can tell you how it will work for you. It's the thing that your destiny is to discover that. And you have to make, you have to make the decisions to begin with. It's like, because you can't do this without commitment. You have to commit to it first. That's the act of faith that, that Kierkegaard was so insistent upon. You have to say, I'm going to act as if being is good. I'm going to act as if truth is the pathway to enlightenment. I'm going to act as if I should pursue the deepest meaning possible in my life. And there's, there's reasons to do none of those. They're real reasons. So it's really a decision. But you, you can't find out what the consequence of the decision is unless you make the decision. I think the same thing happens when you get married, by the way. Is that if you think you might leave, you're not married. And then you think, well, the marriage didn't succeed. It's like, well, maybe you were never married. Because the rule is, you don't get to leave. And there's a reason for that rule. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't situations where there should be exceptions made for that. That's not the point. The point is that there's some games you don't get to play unless you're all in. And the other thing that's so interesting about being alive is that you're all in. 
No matter what you do, you're all in. This is gonna kill you. So I think you might as well play the most magnificent game you can while you're waiting. Because do you have anything better to do? Really? Why not pick the best thing possible that you could do? Why not do that? Maybe you could justify your wretched existence to yourself that way. I think you could. That's what it looks like. You know, people find such meaning in the responsibilities they adopt, it stops making them ask questions about what life is for. If you have a newborn child, for example, like unless you're really in a bad way, psychotically depressed, or, or maybe your personality really needs some retooling, you stop thinking about anything but ensuring that that baby is doing well. And if someone comes along and asks you an existential question about your commitment to that, the right response is, why are you asking me such stupid questions when, when, the, when this, this is manifesting itself right in front of your eyes? Like, how blind can you be? That isn't a time for, for questions about the meaning of life. The answer is right in front of you. And if you can't see it, it's not because life has no meaning, it's because you're blind. I mean, that's what the image of, of, of the Virgin Mother and the child is all about. It's like, what's the answer to the meaning of life? Here's an answer. It's like, well, I'm going to criticize that. Well, go right ahead. You know, it's like, it's like, what, what, you're, you're like a, you're like a, what do you call that? A termite gnawing on a temple. There's no, there's no utility in that sort of criticism. You're, it's blindness. And it's the same thing with regards to the path of the hero. It's like, it glistens in front of you and you can criticize it. It's like, fine. Put the cart before the horse, and, and see how far you get. So I thought, to bring full closure to the class, I was trying to solve this terrible puzzle that confronted me for and many other people, about how it was that human beings got themselves in such a tangle about what they believed. Such a tangle that we were pointing the ultimate weapons of destruction at one another, which, by the way, we are still doing. And I thought, okay, well, I understand that. We need our belief systems. They orient us. And that means there will be conflict between belief systems, and that can be a catastrophe. And that's being played out everywhere again in very many ways. What's the solution to that? Well, one possibility is there's no solution. It's just mayhem all the way around. Could be the case. But it seemed to me, as I delved into it, that the proper solution to that was to live properly as an individual. Because you're more powerful than you think. Way more powerful than you think. I mean, God only knows what you are in the final analysis. You're blind to your own weaknesses, but you're also blind to your own strengths. And so then I think, well, if you got your act together, it'd be better for you. And instantly, it would be better for your family, assuming they wanted you to get your act together. And not everyone does. But, and then it would be better for the community. It's like, how far could you take that? If you stopped wasting time, and if you stopped lying, and if you oriented yourself to to the highest possible good that you could conceive of, and you committed to that. How much good could you do? Well, I would say, why don't you find out? So, that's what I think you should do. You should find out. You don't have anything better to do, and there's nothing in it, as far as I've been able to tell, there's nothing in it but good. So, maybe you could sort yourself out so that you wanted nothing but the good. And, and then maybe you could help make that manifest in the world. And maybe we wouldn't have all these terrible problems then. At least we'd have fewer of them and that would be a start. So, it's the, it's the, the answer to the problem of humanity is the, is, the, is the integrity of the individual. That's the answer. So, and states that are predicated on that realization are healthy. So, and states that aren't are doomed to stagnation and catastrophic collapse. And personalities that are predicated on self-tyranny and the tyranny of others are doomed and doomed to collapse. So, and then you think, well, what's the barrier? And the barrier is, are you willing to accept the responsibility? And part of the answer to that is, 
reduce the dam responsibility until it's tolerable. You don't have to fix everything at once. You could just start by fixing the things that you could fix. Or you could even do it more. You could do it with even less self-sacrifice. You could start by fixing only the things that you want to fix. God, you can get a massive way that way. So, do it. See what happens. That's what you should have been taught in university, right from the beginning. It's like, aim at the highest good. Tool yourself into something that can attain it. And go out there and manifest it in the world. And everything that, everything that comes your way will be... Everything that comes your way will be a blessing. And so, all you have to do is give up your resentment and your hatred. I know that's a hard thing to give up, because you have plenty of reason for it. 